Well, we can tell from that reading that it's not a very pleasant study to start with. I'm sorry about that, but uh, I've got to make apologies because I know that some will be unhappy with the, um, with the gruesome things that we've read about and we're going to talk about to start with. But this study does end in a blessing and God willing we'll get there. But let's, let's now go with Elijah as he uh, goes into the city of Samaria and deals with this problem. So now when we come to 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 24, we read these words. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. In that siege, because they surrounded the city, there was a great famine. But also I believe there was a famine outside of that. There was a famine, there was a siege, so it was a terrible time for those who were living in the city of Samaria. Now Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, in fact Ben-Hadad was a title of a Syrian king's name. In fact this, uh, this was the third Ben-Hadad and the name means son of the Syrian god of storms or Hadad Idrai of the monuments found by archaeologists. So archaeologists have found that this, this Ben Hadad did actually exist in, and uh, that he attacked Samaria. And, and we'd expect that to be correct because we believe all of the Bible to be inspired. But it's just interesting. And so there's a very graphic illustration of what it would have been like uh, for the, the city of Samaria as it was being besieged by the, the Syrians. Now when we look at famines in scripture, there's 13 famines mentioned in the Bible, which is interesting because 13 is the number of rebellion. Let's just have a look at one example I've got here on the screen in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8, please. So this was one of the 13, and God brings famine because of disobedience and rebellion, which he considers to be the same thing. In Genesis chapter 10, it doesn't talk about a famine. In fact, it talks about Nimrod. But Nimrod was the 13th generation from Adam. And we read about Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now it doesn't mean that Nimrod was a, a, a God-fearing man. What it's really saying, it should be translated this way, he in fact was in competition with God. So God had placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and they would have dominion over the animals. They sinned and man lost that dominion. But you see Nimrod went out to make a name for himself and he, he protected the people in the cities from all these wild animals. But he, the, the words really mean he was in competition with God. He was rebellious. He wasn't mighty in God's name. So that's just, and we won't look at the rest of these passages, but whenever we find 13 occurring in Scripture, it is nearly always connected with rebellion. So here we are now in this in the city of Samaria, and it's one of the 13 uh, famines in Scripture. In fact, famines have shaped the destiny of the world. You may or may not be aware of this, that the French Revolution was caused by a famine. Famine out in the countryside in France. The people flocked into the city to try to get food. And of course, only the rich could obtain food. And so the poor people were starving. And so hence, the, they, they started the rebellion, interesting, rebellion again, against the ruling powers and the French Revolution developed. And of course, we know the cry, the frog-like spirits that have come from the French Revolution, liberty, fraternity and equality, which has permeated throughout the whole of the world. So there's a famine that was caused by a volcano, in fact, in Iceland, that's changed the face of the world. And, of course, God will use those things again in the future to change the face of the world. He will use famines again. The passage I'd like you to come with me to, please, in Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6. Here we read about four chariots being, carried, being drawn out by horses that go out between two mountains of brass. Verse 1. 
And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out between two mountains, and the two mountains were of brass. Now, what's that talking about? Well, what it's talking about is talking about the time that's yet in the future, when the Lord Jesus Christ will come. The two mountains of brass represent the king of the north and the king of the south in Bible prophecy. Brass represents flesh. Now, you've got these horses going. They're, they're set out between the king of the north and the king of the south, as the king of the north comes down to invade the land of Israel. Verse 2, in the first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot were black horses, and in the third chariot there were white horses, and in the fourth chariot there were grizzled bay horses, not and, but grizzled bay horses. And of course those horses represent bloodshed, pestilence, famine and storm. So what the scriptures are telling us, that God again is going to use in the future Right when Armageddon's occurring, between those two mountains of brass, these horses and chariots, and of course the chariots in Scripture, the word is Rankav, is symbolical of the saints. We're going to, that's going to be us, brethren and sisters. Unfortunately for the world, we're going to be there executing God's judgments, Psalm 2, upon the wicked world. So these horses will go forth, and they'll bring bloodshed, bloodshed in Armageddon, pestilence and famine and storm as those those words really convey the idea. Verse 4, Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. The black horses which are therein, therein go forth into the north country. Now black in the Bible generally talk, represents pestilence, terrible pestilence which is then followed by famine, which is the white horses. That's the north country. So that's north of, of the, the land of Israel, between the, the, where the king of the north and the king of the south will be. To the north will be you know, the Gogian Russia, Ukraine, Europe. The saints are going to pour judgments out upon those parts of the world after and, and commensurate with Armageddon. The black horses which therein go forth to the north country and the white horses go after them. So pestilence then is followed by famine. Dreadful famine will affect that part of the world, but it will change the world because those people that are left will then turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a famine that's yet to occur in the future that will truly affect the world. And the grizzled go forth toward the south country. And of course that's, that speaks of uh, famine also to the south Egypt, Africa, terrible to think about this is going to happen, but the countries to the south, the judgment will be poured upon them. And the bay went forth and sought that they might walk to and fro, to and fro throughout the whole of the earth. It says the bay or the grizzled, which represents storm, a time of terrible, and there's a, there's a big rain depression coming here. And of course, Brisbane is trying to gear up for that. But in, in that day, it will be absolutely terrible. But in that day, it will be designed to make the people turn again to God. And so famine in the north, these four horses represent that, and the chariots represent the saints. But now coming back, having said that, now we come back to this famine in, in Samaria and see the lessons that occur with this, this horrible famine here in Samaria in Second Kings chapter 6. And so we read in verse 25, And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it, until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. So it's saying this is how terrible this, the famine was, that the people were forced to eating the head of asses. It was an unclean animal but their extremity was so great that they were forced into doing this. Now, the Bible just doesn't mention anything without purpose. There's a reason why an ass's head is mentioned here. And I want to show you what it's all about. I want you to come with me to Jeremiah 22. Jeremiah 22 will give us an idea of what this ass head really spoke about. Now, this is against King Jehoiakim. 
one of the last kings of Judah, a very wicked king, who burnt the word of God, cut it up with a penknife, threw it into the fire. This is what God says concerning Jehoiakim. Verse 18, Jeremiah 22. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, my brother, or Ah, sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, Lord, or Ah, his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of an ass, drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Now, what actually happened to Jehoiakim? Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian army, came down. They took him captive, took him back to Babylon. But the Bible is saying he was such a stubborn man, like a stubborn ass, that he's, he's going to die just like one. He's going to be thrown just outside the city. He's going to be buried with the burial of an ass. Jeremiah 36, verse 30. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out in the day to the heat and in the night to the frost. So, terribly... This wicked king who would not obey God, a rebellious king, a disobedient king, he suffered the same sort of fate that an ass's burial represented, that an ass was just thrown outside. And the ass, the ass represented disobedient and a wicked nation. Come across to Exodus 13 and verse 13. So the ass spoke of a man who would not be redeemed. He, if he wasn't redeemed, he's like an ass. Verse 13, And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among the children shalt thou redeem. So, if a man would not be redeemed, it's just like when you take an ass and you break its neck, and that's what Israel was like. That's what it's talking about here when we come back to Second Kings chapter 6. They're like a man, they're like a king, they're a nation that would not listen to God's word. And so he, they were treated like this, this terrible uh, fate. And they actually now had to eat asses' heads. And of course, that was typical of saying that they would actually eat the, their own flesh, the flesh of their own children. So when we come back to this passage now in Second Kings chapter 6... We read those words. It also says that there would be a fourth part of calves' dung, a cab of doves' dung, for five pieces of silver. Now they didn't eat that, obviously, uh, and it appears that they used that for burning for their food. They had to pay a lot of money just to, to buy a cab, uh, a cab, a little milk bottle full of the waste from doves. Of course, it's just you know. It's just telling us how dreadful the situation was. And, of course, it's a great contrast, isn't it, to the dove that we read of in the Song of Solomon. Come across to the Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 14. So it's a great contrast to what the dove really represents in Scripture. Song of Solomon 2 and verse 14. A symbol of the bride of Christ. Song of Solomon 2 and verse 12, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing is come and the voice of the turtle, as the turtle dove is heard in the land. These are the words of the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grape give it good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. So the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, that's what his bride is like. She's like a lovely dove. But it's the, the exact opposite in contrast to the situation here in the city of Samaria. So evil is it that the dove's waste is used for preparing food. And so the king says, when we come to Second Kings chapter 6 and verse 26, And as the king of Israel was passing upon the wall... There cried a woman unto him and saying, Help my Lord, O King. So, instead of placing her supplication before God, she now calls out to the King. And what does the King say in verse 27? He says, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor 
or out of the wine press. Or as another translation has it, how am I supposed to help you if the eternal doesn't help you? Do you expect me to miraculously get food from empty storerooms or drink from silent wine presses? I can't do anything for you, he says. And so this poor woman's crying out. And the, and the verse 28 we read, And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. Now what a terrible thing. Just think about eating your own children. I mean, we can't even really think about it. What sort of a woman would do that? And yet that was a prophecy in the Bible, that they would do that. Let's just go back to that prophecy in Deuteronomy 28. In Deuteronomy 28, it was prophesied that they would eat their own children. Verse 53 or verse 52. Now here's a prophecy when we read this from verse 49. It talks about a nation as swift as an eagle flieth. Verse 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as an eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Now this is a prophecy here. That verse is referring to the Romans that would come and besiege the city of Jerusalem in AD 70. But you see, this prophecy was even being partially fulfilled now with the Syrians attacking. And it's a type of what the Romans would do. And so we read in verse 53, And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. So that the man that is tender among you and very delicate his eye shall be evil toward his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children which he shall leave, so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in all thy gates. The tender and the delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for her delicateness and tenderness, her eyes shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom and toward her sons and toward her daughter and toward her young that cometh out from between her feet and toward her children which she shall bear. For she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in the gates. That's what this woman was doing and that was, as we can see here, a partial fulfilment of that Bible prophecy and of course these blessings and cursings of Deuteronomy 28 would be brought upon the nation for their disobedience and they were disobedient at the time of Jehoram who was the king here in the time of the siege of Samaria and as you can see on the bottom of that slide Elisha is here held responsible for the siege the king held Elisha responsible and of course he types the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord Jesus Christ is or was responsible for the siege of the city of Jerusalem in AD 70. Same prophecy, but fulfilled in type here in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 29. So we read, So depraved and wretched had the woman become, people become, that the woman could relate every detail to the king. She confessed that she had committed a hideous crime and now appeals to the king for justice because the other woman would not keep her part of the terrible bargain. And of course that reminds us, doesn't, doesn't it, of the wisdom of Solomon. Let's just go to Solomon's wisdom. Very similar, similar situation in 2 Kings chapter 3. First, sorry, 1 Kings chapter 3. verses 26 and 27 and of course we know the story here don't we that the woman's child had died during the night and we read in verse 22 and the other woman said nay but the living is my son as they approached Solomon and the dead is thy son 
And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, The one the one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is, is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. And of course, as we would expect, then spake the woman whose living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it neither be mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And it goes on to say that all Israel saw the wisdom and the justice of Solomon in that. But when we come to the situation here, there was no wisdom, no justice, no appeal to God, and the king simply said, King Jehoram said, well, what do you expect me to do? I can't do anything. I can't help you at all, he says. He goes on to say in Second Kings 6 and verse 31, and verse 30, and it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and passed by upon the wall and the people looked and behold he had sackcloth within upon his flesh and then he said God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha the son of Shaphat shall stand on him this day so he says look I'm going to cut Elisha's head off he's the one that's caused all this trouble and so the king put on sackcloth and you can see an, an illustration of what sackcloth might have looked like like a hessian bag an outward show to say well look I'm trying to do something he really wasn't a, a righteous king at all he was putting on an outward show and he said I can't do anything there was no appeal to God in any of this at all he just said I can't help you at all and so the king had sackcloth on and he says he calls Elisha he says in verse 32 but Elisha sat in his house and the elders sat with him and the king sent a man from before him but ere the messenger came to him he said to the elders See ye how this son of a murderer hath sent to take away mine head. Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. And so Elisha calls King Jehoram the son of a murderer. Of course, he was the son of Ahab. And Ahab was a murderer. But you see, he also was the seed of the serpent. There's a very interesting Bible passage that I'd like you to look at in relation to the seed of the serpent and a murderer and it is in uh, John chapter 8 so I come across to John chapter 8 and verse 44 here's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to the Pharisees and to the Sadducees and he says in verse 43 why do ye not understand my speech even because ye cannot hear my word ye are of your father the devil and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Now who's the Lord Jesus Christ referring to here? Who is the murderer, your father the murderer? Well he's referring to the serpent you see. It's the serpent in Eden. Now the word murderer is not the word murderer. As you can see on the screen, it's a manslayer. So let me explain to you. When somebody commits murder in, in justice courts today, if somebody goes out with intent to kill somebody, deliberately to kill somebody, that is tried as murder. And that's what the Bible also defines murder as. But if somebody accidentally dies, then it's called manslaughter. Now the Bible is actually saying here that the serpent wasn't a deliberate murderer. It was a manslayer. How was it a manslayer? Well, the serpent just was a, a carnal reasoning animal. It express, expressed its carnal reasoning and it said, look, if you do this, you won't die. And of course it was a lie. And as a result of Eve doing that and then Adam, everybody has died as a result of what the serpent said. But it didn't, it didn't really intend to go out and murder all of the rest of the human race. It, so it's, it's manslaughter. It didn't intend to do it. 
Now, there's a, another Bible passage I'd like you to look at in 1 John 3.15. 1 John 3.15. Now, John's talking about our relationship with our brethren and sisters. Verse 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Now the word once again doesn't mean murder, it's the word manslayer, manslaughter. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. So, you know, and I mean, unfortunately, brethren and sisters, I've seen this where brethren do get very, uh, in, in nasty situations, and I have seen hatred in the ecclesial world. We shouldn't see it. But it does happen. Now the Bible is saying that when somebody does that, they don't really intend, if we've got a problem with somebody and we can't get close to them and we dislike them because the word hate actually means to love less, if we find that we've got somebody like that in the ecclesia and we don't, we wouldn't really murder them, but we might be guilty of manslaughter. Now how could we do that? Well, by treating them incorrectly by causing to trip up and to, maybe to leave the truth. So we need to be very, very careful with what we're doing in our relationships with, with each other. Whosoever loves less his brother or sister is a manslayer. They don't, we don't intend to kill them, but they could end up dying. And we could also die ourselves. And ye know that no murderer or manslayer hath eternal life abiding in him. So that's just a little diversion for a bit of a lesson about how our hearts might work. But here in the scriptures, this man Jehoram, he really was the seed of the serpent. And he really, this time, was it wasn't just manslaughter. He was wanting to actually take off Elisha's head. He, there, was heart, there was murder in his heart. When we come back to, uh, to 2 Kings chapter 6, he says, look, I want to take Elisha's head off him. I want to murder him. Murder was in his heart. But there's Elisha just sitting quietly in his house. He's not perturbed. He's putting his trust completely in God. And so we see here that Elisha sat in his house. And in verse 33 we read, And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him. So Jehoram sent a messenger. And then Jehoram decided, well, no, look, I better go myself also. And so he marches down the street with all his soldiers. And they're going, tromp, tromp. Trump, and Elisha can hear all the soldiers coming down the street. He says, he says, verse 33, verse, end of verse 32, is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? That's all the army who's coming now to take Elisha. And while he had talked with them, behold, the messenger came and said unto him, he said, and this is, really is Jehoram, he said, this evil is of the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? So Jehoram was saying, all this trouble, all this trouble is God's fault. You know, sometimes, brothers and sisters, we blame God for problems in our lives. We shouldn't do that. And we might do that indirectly. But that's what Jehoram was doing. He was blaming God for the problem that was really his fault. He should have been leading Israel, should have been fearing Yahweh, worshipping Yahweh, and leading the nation in the right way. And so he says, why should I wait? Why should I wait any longer? And of course, patience in tribulation is very, very important. And there's Elisha, he just sat there. Here's an impatient king saying, I can't wait any longer. I'm going to kill this Elisha. And Elisha's just sitting there. He waits in contrast. He waits on Yahweh. They've got a Bible quote there I'd like you to turn to. Lamentations 3, verse 25. Lamentations, just after the Jeremiah, the, lament, the Lamentations of Jeremiah. Lamentations 3, verse 25. And of course, Jeremiah is talking about all the horrible things that have just happened to the city of Jerusalem. But he says in verse 25, Yahweh is good unto them that wait for him to the soul that seeketh him. 
Now the word wait here is the Hebrew word that has got the idea of entwining oneself around God, being bound up with God. That's the idea of this word. So no matter what the crisis is in our lives, and this is what Elisha was doing, he was closely bound up with God. He could wait patiently. Verse 26, It is good that a man should, but should both hope and quietly wait. And we have to do that, brethren and sisters, in, a, in the, all the crises in our lives. You know, sometimes when we're young, we think, look, I want this problem to be solved. I want this to be fixed up straight away. I can't cope with it anymore. You know, God says, no, you must learn patience and we must quietly wait for the... Sal and the word salvation is the word rescue, for the rescue of the Lord. So here was Elisha just sitting in his house. He was quietly waiting for the rescue of the Lord. And we need to do that in our lives. Just, just whatever the crisis is, instead of getting very, very anxious, just quietly wait. Because God's working. We might be able to see it. God is working. We need to have faith in that. And so now, chapter 6 flows into chapter 7, as we read tonight. We read in chapter 7 and verse 1. Then Elisha said, he makes a prophecy. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. You know, whereas the day before, you know, you had to pay all this money for the head of an ass and, and some terrible material to heat your food with. In one day, the situation was going to change. And of course, you know, some people say that's impossible. Verse 2. Then a Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if Yahweh would make windows in heaven, if God would open up the heavens and all the rain fell out, might this thing be? He said, he's saying, look, this couldn't happen. It's impossible. And Elisha said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. In today's language, it's equivalent to saying, well, look, the USA debt problem is going to be solved tomorrow. Now, the, the people of the world would say, well, that's impossible. I mean, even Australia's debt problem, we could say, to be solved tomorrow. That's impossible. But, you know, we, nothing is impossible with God. We've got that passage there in Luke 137, haven't we? Where, where Mary said, how can this be? And the angel said, with God... Nothing is impossible. And that, that's real. And now look, brethren and sisters and young people, we all believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. We believe the kingdom of God is going to be established. We don't doubt that. But sometimes when we have a problem in our life and we just think, well, I just cannot see how this can be resolved, we need to remember that Bible passage that nothing is impossible with God. We need to remember this situation here that in one day the circumstances can be changed. Now you may have experienced that. Gail and I have lived for 70 years nearly and we have experienced that sort of thing in our lives. Things can change overnight but we need to put our trust in God. And of course that's what Elisha was saying. It says here in verse 2, the Lord on whose hand the king leaned. Now, Desenius says that this is really the man who sat in the seat of the chariot next to the king. He was the captain of the bodyguard. So he was a very important man. He had a very important position. Uh, it would appear that he was the bodyguard on, on whose hand King Jehoram leaned. Particularly when he rode in his chariot, he was his bodyguard. And the same, same word is used of Naaman. Just come back to Second Kings chapter 5 and verse 18. You'll probably remember these words. 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 18. In this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant that when my master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand. You see, Naaman was the chief of the Syrian army in chapter 5, and he was the king's right-hand man. He went into the temple with him. He supported the king. Well, this man here, in chapter 7 was in the same position. A very important man. You know, a very important man in the world, if you like. And it's like us you know, giving a Bible passage to perhaps 
the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia or to the Premier of Queensland and saying, look, Jesus Christ is coming, and they won't reply and say, well, look, that's silly, that's not going to happen. But we know what God has said is true. And so here was this important man. He was going to learn a lesson that was going to cost him his life. And so this bodyguard found this whole notion quite preposterous and quite unbelievable. Elisha was saying the famine and inflation would be wiped out in one day. The bodyguard exclaimed, that can't happen, not even if the Lord himself were to send rain all at once. And for him, there was to be a dreadful consequence for such unbelief. Thou shalt see it, said Elijah, you'll see it happen, but you won't eat thereof. And of course, it's probably a little bit like the world. Some of the people in the world will see the Lord Jesus Christ coming, but they won't partake of the blessings. We've told them it's going to happen. They'll see some of the things happening, but they will not partake because like this man, they will die. But now we have a very interesting prophecy about how this would happen. Oh, by the way, this is not a cappuccino. I just couldn't find the glasses, it's water. So <laughs> don't get jealous. <laughs> no, it's really cappuccino. <laughs> it's Adam's ale. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so here we've got now, in the, and we haven't had time to read this, but I do want to work through this. We've got events here now that just shows how Yahweh providentially works out his will. Reactions and thoughts all seem perfectly normal, yet silently behind the scenes, God is working out his purpose. And of course, we've got that passage there in Romans that we know that all things work together for good, to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. So if we want to get a message out of this little bit of the Bible, the message really is we have to trust in God because while we're worrying about something over here, things are happening over here. God's working on circumstances over there that's going to change everything for us. And so here we read in verse 3 of 2 of Second Kings 7 that there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate and they said to one another, why sit we here until we die? Now it's interesting, Samaria, the name Samaria means guardianship. But it was a leprous city. These men were sitting right outside of the gate and they were leprous. And this city was a leprous city. It was supposed to be guarding the things of God's word. But no, it wasn't. It was a leprous. And these four lepers were sitting at the gate. The Levitical law banned them. They had to be outside of the city. But, you know, this was a time of terrible siege, no food. And here's Jehoram, hard-hearted Jehoram that he was. He said, no, those men, they can't come in. They've got to still stay outside the city. They can't come into the city. So they were just at the entering into the gate. But it says there were four of them. And, of course, in the New Testament, we read the Lord Jesus Christ said there were quite a number of lepers in the time of Elisha but Naaman was the only one, the only one that responded to the word of God. But these men, even though they didn't respond to the word of God, they were used by God for a purpose. These four lepers were the ones to whom the fulfilment of Elisha's prophecy had been committed. The prophecy about the famine ending. How could that be? Now look, we wouldn't have chosen anybody like this to preach the truth. This is These people, these lepers are really a type of people who are preaching glad tidings. That's what they did. They brought good news into the city. And, of course, it teaches us another lesson that God chooses instruments that we would not normally choose. Come across to this passage in 1 Corinthians 1, 27. God used these lepers to bring good news. 1 Corinthians 1. First Corinthians one twenty seven. Verse twenty six. But ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now it doesn't mean that brethren and sisters are, are silly, but we are not in the worldly scheme of things 
well-known, famous people as such. Verse 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, the things which are despised, God hath chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God used four lepers here to save the city of Samaria. Now, we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't go and enlist four, four lepers to preach the truth. But God did. And so it's this principle here. He's chosen what the world considers to be foolish. That's what it should be. God chose what is foolish in the world's eyes. That's how it should be translated. God chose what is foolish. You know, people say, well, these Christadelphians, they go off to their Bible class, they have this meeting every Wednesday night, every Sunday night, Sunday morning. They're silly. They can have a great time going out to football, watching TV, staying home, doing whatever. That's what the world calls great time. But the world says what we're doing is foolish. But it's not. But God has chosen the very simple things of the world for people to come to him, not on the basis of flesh, but on the basis of his word. So here they were, these four lepers. Come back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 7. Here they were. They were between... Now the Syrians, we saw as we started, they were camped outside the city. So here that his poor men are at the gate of the city. They were between Samaria and the Syrian camp. They were in between. The Syrians had plenty and the Samaritans had... People in Samaria had nothing. They were between famine and plenty. Now generally speaking, we are in a similar position between famine and plenty. I want you to look at these two passages. Proverbs 30 verse 7 Proverbs 30 verse 7 verse 2 things have I required of thee deny me them not before I die remove far from me vanity and lies and this is a prayer by Solomon he prays for this Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient or fit for me. Or the Hebrew is that which we have need of. Feed me with food that we have need of. So Solomon is praying, I mean, he became very rich, but he did fall. But he is praying here, don't make me poor, Verse 9, lest I be full, well, he says, don't make me rich, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So we need to pray for that, brethren and sisters. We shouldn't pray to be rich because we're being told here it can take us away from the truth. The truth. And of course, we don't want to be so poor that we have to do things that are not honest. And, and generally speaking, Christadelphians generally speaking, fall into that ambit, into that vein. We're, we're reasonably well off, but we're not extremely wealthy. But this, we're not, uh, and uh, the average brother and sister is not exceedingly poor either. God provides that which is necessary and for our life in the truth, and we should ask for no more. That's the point. Okay, Psalm 37, verse 25. Psalm 37, Verse 25. Psalmist says, I have been young and now am old, and yet I have and yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Very comforting, isn't it, brethren and sisters? You know, God hasn't hasn't said, Look, I'm going to make you filthy rich, but he has said that he would provide us with our daily bread. And that's what the psalmist is saying. He's never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Now, I know there are difficult times, difficult times come and go. But generally speaking, that is a principle. And here are, here are these four lepers. They represent that. They're between Samaria, poverty, and between the riches that the, the Syrians have got. Now, when we come back to chapter 7, they actually go through a reasoning process commencing in verse 4. 
They say, if we say we shall enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. If we sit here, we'll die also. Now therefore come and let us fall under the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall die. So they, you know, it's a little bit like us sometimes. We get a problem, we say, well, look, we'll do this, and we'll do this, and we'll do this. So the first thought was, well, look, they could make their way back into Samaria. But they said, well, look, that's not a very good idea because there's no food there. We could stay where we are uh, and just wait to die, but that's not very good either. Or perhaps we could defect to the Syrians and be killed on sight. At least we'd have that would be a benefit in one way that we wouldn't suffer. Or the Syrians might welcome them as informers and the Syrians didn't worry about lepers. So they weren't too sure, but they looked at all of the possible uh, alternatives. But they could not have envisaged what actually happened. Now, this is what happens to us, brethren and sisters. You know, sometimes we sit down and we think, well, no, we can do this, we can do this, we can do that. And look, I've seen this quite often in ecclesial situations, in meetings with brethren. They say, well, look, you know, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. But, you know, forget one thing. God. You know, I always say now, brethren and sisters, well, it's either that's going to happen or that's going to happen. No, there's a third thing. If God gets involved, things can change. And we don't know. And that's what happened here. They could not have envisaged the fifth alternative. And sometimes we can't see any alternative to a dilemma we're facing. However, the principle emerges, whatever our plight is, we can't sit idly by and wait for a solution. Life in the truth requires action, not passive faith. So if we've got a problem, we don't just sit on our hands and say, well, I'll wait for God to save me. We've got to try and do something, but put our faith in God. We need to give ourselves a dedicated service, as the passage in James says. And so we read in verse 7, Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight. Interesting time of day. They fled in the twilight and left their tent. Now this is, sorry, this is not the lepers, this is the Syrians. Let's just read verse 6. Verse 5, sorry, verse 5. And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there's nobody there. Well, twilight, that's, you know, just as the sun's going down. And, and they, they got there, nobody, and they never expected that to happen. Verse 6. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and they fled for their life. So, right when the lepers were thinking of doing something, God was doing something at the same time. Now, it says it was at twilight. As you can see on the screen there, twilight the word actually means well it's the word nephesh but it's got this additional meaning a breeze at dusk when the evening breeze prevails and it's the word that's used in uh, in uh, genesis chapter 3 where the voice of yahweh elohim was walking in the garden in the cool of the day so it's twilight it's like a gentle breeze in the cool of the day twilight is the time when God's judgments are operative. Now, when we say twi twilight is just before the night. Now, brethren and sisters, we are living in the twilight of the world's history. The night is going to come. I've got some passages there, but I can't turn them up for you because, well, I charge $120 an hour and I'll be here for too long. It costs too much. <laughs> so I just can't. But there are some passages there that are very interesting in relation to twilight where God works in the twilight and God brings his judgments. It says that the Syrians heard the noise of chariots. Well, well not actually the sound of chariots, but Yahweh had opened the ear of the Syrians to the spirit. You know, it was really probably just like a rustling of, bre of a breeze in the trees, but they thought it was the Hittites and that the Hittites were known for their horses and their chariots and, the, and their great... Uh, enemy, they were great enemies uh, of, uh, of the Syrians. 
They were renowned for their, their chariots and their horses. And so the Syrians fled for their life. And all God did was make a little noise. And of course, everything was going to change. And so what has happened, you know, Yahweh's working at both ends of the line. There's a famine over here. People are starving. But there's people over here who've got plenty of food and plenty of everything. And he's going to do so. And so he opens up the storehouse for the people that are starving. And it's, that's what it's like for us, brethren and sisters, while we're sometimes worrying about some existing problem in our life. Now, I, I tell you, I don't worry much anymore. I used to. I, I used to come home from AB's meetings or whatever, couldn't sleep. Now, I do not worry. When I say I don't worry, I just hand my worries over to our Heavenly Father. Because while we're worrying about something, God's working at the other end of the line, and we need to understand that. <laughs> need to understand God's work let's have a look at this passage in Isaiah 23 verse 17 this is a Bible prophecy but it just shows how God also works at the other end of the line Isaiah 23 verse 17 and, it's, and of course this is a prophecy about Britain or Tyre and Bible prophecy and it shall come to pass at the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre and she shall turn to her hire and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. And of course I believe that's a reference to Britain's involvement in the common market. And while all that's going on it says, And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to the Lord. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord, to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. So while the world's working on all the financial problems and stashing up gold and silver and they're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow God just says well thank you very much we're going to use that in the kingdom of God for those who put their trust and confidence in me that's what it's saying God always is working at both ends of the line and so when we come now back to 2 Kings chapter 7 Verse 8, And when the lepers came to the uttermost cart of the camp, they come into the Syrian camp, they went into one tent, and they did eat and drink, and they carried from silver and gold and raiment, and they went and hid it, and they came and entered another tent, and they carried it also, and they went. So they, you know, they're just having a wonderful time. They were starving, and they've just got this absolute bounty. And of course, it's so true of human nature. You know, the first impulse is eat and drink. The next one is satisfy ourselves with possessions then what well if we've got a conscience we start to realize that there's more to life than that we're not going to turn to that passage in Luke 12 we know the story of the bigger and better barns where the man said you know I've got all this riches I've built myself bigger and better barns and God takes his life away from him what good is his life to him we need to realize that our lives are in the hand of God it's not food and drink it's not possessions God gives us those things that we might use them to help us to get to the kingdom and so here they were they, they, they did have a pang of their conscience in verse 9 and they said one to another we do not well this day a day of good tidings you know this is a day when we need to preach the gospel good tidings this is a day of good tidings and we hold a peace we're not telling anybody about the good news and if we tarry till the morning light some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. So they packed up, the four of them hobbled off, and they went to the, the porter, the gatekeeper of the city, and they told them at the gate, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and the tents as they were. So they said, Well, that's what we found. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. So the news got through to the king. Now what these lepers had meant life to a perishing world. But you see the people inside the city were not really inclined to hear the good tidings. The king in particular. It's a little bit like us. You know, the world's in a terrible state. It's in a, in a state of siege really. And if we go out to try to preach the truth in the world they don't want to hear. 
There is maybe some that do, but not everybody does. But these people were in a, in a starving condition. Now remember, I started our Bible class by saying four horses would go out and judgments would be brought on the world. That will bring the world to its knees and the world will want Christ. The world will want salvation. The world does not want it today. But here in Samaria, these, some of these people, some people were prepared to listen. And of course, it, it, the lesson it's teaching us that we need to be careful when we preach the truth, not to cast our pearls before swine. Now, we've got to make some sort of a judgment. We don't go into a hotel where everybody's drunk and start preaching the truth. We preach it to people who, who are looking for it. We've got to reach out to them some way. So that's what these, these men were doing. But see, here was Jehoram's reaction. Verse 12. And the king arose in the night and said to his servants, I'll tell you what they're doing. It's a trick. That's what he said. I'll tell you what the Syrians, they know that we're hungry. Therefore, are they gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the field, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. And so, you know, here's Jehoram. He just couldn't see God's hand in any events of life. Everything was bad news. You know, there's that passage, let favour be shown to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. God was showing favour to King Jehoram and he wasn't going to listen. He spoke the sum total of what he'd learnt about God, nothing. Now, if his opinion prevailed, nothing would have happened. Nobody would have been saved. And we can be like Jehoram sometimes. We can say, no, I'll just be negative or we can put our faith and trust in God. And so there was one in his house, verse 13, and one of his servants answered and said, let some I take thee, and I'll re let's just read this translation on the screen because it's clearer. Pray, he says, send, send some men with five of the horses that are left. If they live, they will fare like all the multitude of Israel who survive here. And if they die, they die like all the multitude of Israel that perish here. Let us send and see. Let's just go out and see. What have we got to lose? That's what he's saying. We've got nothing to lose. Jehoram couldn't even see that. So here was some logic. And so they sent out. And what do they find? Verse 14. And they took thereof two chariot horses, and the king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. And they went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels which the Syrians had cast away in their haste, and the messengers returned and told the king. So that the Syrians were so afraid that they just went for their lives, they left everything behind and they dropped all their clothes along the way. And of course it's a symbol of the fate of those who are the enemies of Israel. The same thing will happen to them. We haven't got time to turn up that passage. But God will execute his judgments upon the nations and they will flee. God will just have to blow, as it were, a little gentle wind and they'll be so afraid they'll flee from the presence of Yahweh. And of course that's what they did here and... Then we read, the prophecy is fulfilled in verse 16. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel according to the word of the Lord. And so the prophecy was fulfilled. Man said it couldn't happen. Well, what happened to the man that said it couldn't happen? Well, verse 17. Well, the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate and the people trod upon him in the gate and he died. You know, he was this very important man, perhaps the prime minister. I'm sending you down to control the people at the gate. He gets down to the gate and the people just knock him over and they trample him to death. Verse 18, And it came to pass as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying two measures of barley for a shekel, and a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. And the Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. And so it fell out upon him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. So he met a terrible end. Now we said, brethren, sisters and young people, that the study was a siege, a famine and a blessing. We have got a blessing, but we've got a further blessing. And please just bear with me, because I'm going to have to squeeze this in here. Chapter 8, it really is the blessing 
is the Shunammite. Remember the Shunammite? Remember the woman whose little son died in being sick with sunstroke? Elisha restored him to life. The woman who had built the little room for Elisha? Well, here she is again. After seven years of famine in, in 2 Kings chapter 8. And what Elisha had said to this woman, it said that she had to leave her house in 2 Kings chapter 8 and verse 1. And this was before the famine. Then spake Elisha unto the woman, whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise and go thou and thy household, and sojourn whithersoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall come upon the land for seven years. So while all this was going on in Samaria, this woman had gone, and she'd gone in fact to the land of the Philistines, verse 2. And the woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And so she left behind all of her farm. Everything was left behind for seven years. And it was we all overgrown. Nothing was done there for seven years. And she sojourned. She, as it says, she sojourned there. She was a sojourner in the land. And of course, that's what we are, brethren and sisters. That's what Abraham was. He was a sojourner. You know, we're like this woman. We need to obey what God has said. There's a famine out there in the world. We need to sojourn. But there will come a time when the famine ends and we will return to the land. And just at that time, in verse 4 of chapter 8, verse, verse 3, And it came to pass, as the seven years end, that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and her land. So she's now come back to the king and just at that same, right at that very same time, verse 4, and the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. And it came to pass, as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life, that behold... Who comes in the door but the woman? The woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman and this is her son whom Elisha hath restored to life. Now here's providence, brethren and sisters. Here's just things all falling into place very, very nicely. This woman happened to return right at the very time when Gehazi is talking to the king and telling the king all about it. Of course, what happened? Well, the king makes a royal decree. Verse 6, And when the king asked the woman, she told him everything. So the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land, even until now. So the king said, This woman who's lost everything, I'm appointing a man, an officer to go with her and everything's going to be restored it's going to be restored in fact he says sevenfold for seven years what she's lost is going to be restored over seven years that's a little bit like us getting back paid for seven years so if our pay is probably sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year that's um, four hundred and twenty nearly five hundred thousand dollars if you come back and she received all of this money and was blessed now why was she blessed well she was blessed because she did what God said you see she went out and she became a sojourner when there was a terrible she obeyed she could have said oh no no I love my farm I, I'm going to stay here I really don't want to go anywhere else she would not have been blessed and we have to be like her we have to be prepared to be sojourners we don't belong in this world we need to obey what God says and go out from the world and there will come a time a time in God's providence when we will be brought again like this woman. And so we say the same happy rewards await those who are faithful, those who have hearkened to the words of warning and left behind the things of this age and fled from a world besieged by famine of the word of God. And thus the Shunammite lost nothing. And hopefully it will be for us too, brethren and sisters, we will find that all things have worked together for good. Let's have a look at this passage in Matthew 19 as we draw this to a close. Matthew 19, verse 28, or verse 27, Matthew 19. 
Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, Matthew 19, 27, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, well, that's hard enough to do, but it can be done, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, you just try that, brethren and sisters. You try forsaking your family. For my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. So that we are exhorted that we do have to leave anything behind that will separate us from God because we are sojourners. But if we do, brethren and sisters, nothing shall be lost Nothing shall be lost. God will return to us the blessings. We don't have time to turn up the passage. We have that wonderful passage in Ecclesiastes 11 that we are to cast our bread upon many waters for we shall find it in many days. We're to spread the truth. We're to do what God says in faithful obedience to the commands of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We will find the blessings after many days. We might not get it now but we will find the blessings. And so when we come to the judgment seat, and let's make this our last passage in Matthew 25, brethren and sisters, when we come to the judgment seat and the Lord Jesus Christ will say to us, Matthew 25, verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. And I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him and say, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king said and answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it to me. But then on the other hand he shall say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then they shall say and answer him, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them and say, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not, to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So might it be, brethren and sisters, that we will make our answer now, that we will be like that sojourning Shunammite woman, even though we live in a time of famine, that we will obey the word of God, that we will love our brethren, and that we will nurture them, and that we might be given that reward when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, truly a blessing. We have seen a famine and a siege in our own lives. We go through famine and siege, but we learn, we yearn for that blessing and we've seen those great lessons here this night. So thank you very much, brothers and sisters and young people.